What is up, fishy people? Josh here with Ohio Fish Rescue. Well, you guys just seen the awesome scape off. You guys seen the awesome heartwarming video of the super cool donation to Matt's Monster Fish. Always gotta love seeing friends stay in the hobby after disaster strikes. But, as always, we gotta keep on moving forward. So first off, I'm just going to go through a list of the fish that we went ahead and gave Matthew. So uh, you guys know he got, got the awesome uh, donation from one of our subscribers. Well, he also had a bunch of fish in the making. Well, I went ahead and went through my personal collection and we gave him a bu bunch of fish as well. We gave him one of our Ripsaw or Niger catfish. And uh, he was super stoked to get that, that replaced. That was one of his uh, favorite fish to keep with the rays. So he went ahead and took that, that home. We also gave him a baby. It was only about five inches. It was a rescue that just came in, but he was growing out a red tail. So we went ahead and replaced that for him. Of course, when it gets too, too big, he always knows he can bring it back up to us. But uh, to go along with that, he also had a shovel nose and uh, I went ahead in my personal collection and picked him out our smallest shovel nose. He wasn't in this tank, he was actually in the 750, but the markings on him were just ridiculous. So I went ahead and sent that home with Matt as well. So that was a 16 inch tiger shovel nose. So there went three catfish right there. And then we've also gave Matt a Midas. He, he was sort of a color morph like this guy, but his, uh, his tail markings were that of a flower horn. So he was really cool. So if you guys want to see the awesome fish that we sent home with Matt, you guys are going to have to go ahead and check out his latest videos on his channel, Matt's Monster Fish. And of course, we also gave him our P14 Galaxy Male and our Matoro Male to try and uh, help him with his breeding project again. We are also breeding rays. Now, we had a couple questions on that. Well, if you guys are a rescue, what, why are you trying to breed fish? Well, if you know that we are a rescue, we are a non-profit, and the donations help significantly, but they do not 100% run this place. So everything has been out of pocket for us, and an easy way for us to uh, offset that cost is to go ahead and breed stingrays. Now, we, we, we don't rescue the, these guys. M most of the time, we do buy them and we try and uh, breed them to help offset the cost of the, the rescue. If we can go ahead and make this money, we can continue doing what we, we love and helping out the community as much as possible. You know, so we're, we're not adding to the problem. The, the people who can and afford the setups for stingrays, they 99 times out of 100 don't need them rescued. Not saying I haven't rescued rays before, because I have. If you actually look over here, there is a Bosmani female that we went ahead and rescued. And there's another one in here. I don't know where she's. Oh, she's right next to the Bosmani. There we are. So uh, it does happen, I'm not saying it doesn't, but we, nine times out of 10, go ahead and buy these breeders in hopes that we can get them breeding. And we sell the pups off at super deals, so everyone who wants to try and afford a Stingray can, and it helps us do what we love and help the community that much more. Like right here, this is a, uh, a, a king hen that we got from Vince Wu, and this is a Henley Eye female that we bought off of uh, our buddy John Carter. She is just getting to a size to where she might be able to breed. If you don't know about Henley eyes, they are super old before they even attempt to breed. So she's just getting to that age and that size that she might breed. And uh, who knows, maybe in the future I will have a few more breeders and be able to help offset this cost even more and expand the operation. But enough with the fish talk. If you guys want to go ahead and see the fish that we sent home with Matt, check out his uh, latest video. It should be coming out this week. But we want to go in here 
and talk about these puppies right here. So you guys know we had just got done with the scape off. My dad did the 700 gallon with the pyramid structure for the Frontosa. I did the nice uh, nature look for the peacock bass and plecos. Wait a minute. There's another tank up and going. Yes, while we were setting this up, while I was doing the, the plumbing, which I'm going to talk about in a second, I went ahead and hooked this tank up as well. So as you can see, yes, it does have the bubble wall of death that was already siliconed in. And in there, we went ahead and finished covering the bottom with gravel. Now up here, I did an inch and a half bulkhead to a nut 90, and this is an insertable overflow. So it skims off the top and uh, keeps my water level right where I want it. So th this has a lot of water pumping through and it's basically just a pass through system. But here we have the Frantosa tank. It's a little bit sunny right now as you can see with the, the skylights. So it's a little bit harder to see. And then we have the thousand gallon peacock bass with the plecos in here. So we went ahead and added four plecos in here. There is uh, the albino jibiceps pleco. There is a chocolate. Wait, there goes the, the albino jib right there. They are absolutely loving the, the wood. They're loving sucking all over the rocks. This rock was covered in algae. They already cleaned that, that off. Under there is the uh, chocolate pleco. These guys came from the 2200. And then in here is also the black dragon cactus plecos or the Pseudocanthicus serratus, which we got from Jim Kitchens. Um, I don't necessarily see them right this second, but they might pop up here. They, they are black on a black tank, so very hard to see. We also have six different peacock bass in here. This is an Azul peacock bass. Look at them blue colors. Just absolutely stunning in the, the sunlight, which now I'm hoping that... Uh, being out here in the sunlight, these guys are going to see some crazy, crazy color. This is a uh, 17 inch or so mono peacock bass. We've got a hybrid of some sort down here. I'm not sure what he's mixed with. And this looks to me to be a Kelbetberry hybrid. But it's kind of hard to tell on him because he's not getting his colors. But he's kind of getting that gold hue in his tail. He was uh, brought to us as a Kegelberry, but I'm not too sure about that. So I'm going to go ahead and let him develop before I go ahead and make a call and say this is a Kegelberry. Because he, he could, you know, turn out just to be an Azul hybrid or something like that and just have great coloring on him. But there are six different bass in here. So there's the last one hiding back in there. You can see. He mans that cave back there. They absolutely love the structure. But man, this is coming to be one of my favorite tanks. But the biggest problem I have. So we clean these tanks all the time. People love to come up and go, oh my God, this is so awesome. And it's glass and they leave streaks like that. That is one of my biggest pet peeves around here. And uh, I left it dirty so I can show you guys this. Because anytime you have people here looking at, at the tanks, people are up there putting their hands on the glass. I try and keep people from doing it, but that, that is one of the biggest problems around here with trying to keep glass clean. Because, you know, we, we like to let people enjoy our setups too and come in and view the fish, but then it's more work for us trying to keep them clean. But I do absolutely love the scape on this 1,000 gallon peacock bass and pleco tank. And of course, these Frontosa are looking marvelous. The, the blue with the white was just a marvelous contrast. Over here in the sunlight, everything kind of gets washed out. But at nighttime, this is just a miraculous looking tank. You can see the bubbles are coming out on front. They're coming up from behind. We have a linear air pump running this along with the bubbles over here. Don't mind the sunlight. You can see they're coming out from all different points on that rock. And it's uh, creating a great, great flow in the tank and also a cool bubble feature. So we have a linear air pump running all of these tanks and eventually I will hook, have them tanks hooked up on quarantine. So bringing this back, you guys are probably wondering how I decided to finally do the filtration. Well, you can see we've got some pipes over here. 
And you guys are probably itching to figure out how these big boys are filtered. So if you guys remember in a previous video, you can tell I was talking about how I'm going to go ahead and run the pump up from this pump vault up through the tanks and come back through the waterfalls. Well, that is exactly what we, we did. So I went ahead and shut our, our filtration off in this pond for a day. And I went ahead and I cut the pipes. So I'm gonna see, I'm gonna take you along and show you exactly what I did. So let me get this out the way. You guys can see that 90 right there to that, that V, that top valve goes to the small waterfall. And then I basically cut it right here. It used to 90 and go towards that red valve right there. And that was controlling the other waterfall. So basically, I went ahead and cut this, ran this pipe all the way back here. And then I ran it back here and over and up. And basically it goes on top of the tank. Now it runs all the way across the, the tank over to here, bam. Now I have it teed off here and going to a uh, 45 because it was splashing a lot of water. So what this does here, there's air actually coming down, uh, water mixing with air, so it's aerating the water, and there's also a lot of water coming in this tank. And then I have it teed off again. They, they are the, uh, the sanitary tees, so the water hits it and comes in. You can see teed off here, and you can actually see the water on this one. It's uh, definitely a good portion coming into this set up in Hunter. And then bam, another tee all the way over to here into the 500 and it's basically coming in right there. You guys can see right on top of the water level, that is a lot of water. That is an inch and a half pipe there. And uh, that basically flows through this tank. With the help of the bubbles, it keeps the water churning, the water coming in so it creates a, a big directional flow. And you can see there's no sediment on the bottom of this tank. It keeps it all suspended and then goes out the top of the tank. Now you guys are probably wondering, why did you uh, tee it here and then tee it there? Why, why didn't you put it in the middle of the tank or why didn't you keep them all on the left side of the tank? Well here, I'm gonna go ahead and explain this now. So everywhere we have the outlet, we have the inlet coming in on the opposite side of the tank. So this is coming in on the left side, turning and basically going out this way, a big spiral, and then it leaves in the top left corner. This 700 here, we have it coming in this side, and then it basically pushes through, and then it leaves right here. We have the overflow here to a pipe to extend it up to where we want the water level, and then it basically leaves this tank comes all the way down, 90s back, 90s over, and then I have a T to where this tank comes up and comes in right to the side of the 500 right there. So it all T's back in, and then I up the pipe size, running across the entire back of this tank, and then it basically pops out right here. So you can see where it comes around on the back, and it T's in right here. So if you guys had to guess, yes. So we have the water coming in on this side of the bass tank, and then we, we swish it through, which you, you guys know there were some uh, bulkheads over here. I went ahead and capped and painted over. So I had to figure out a way to pipe in this thousand gallon. I went ahead and cut in a new two inch bulkhead in the back side here. And luckily I was able to get it right here and to where I just put a strainer on there. I don't know if you guys can see, probably not, it's a black strainer, but it was basically right here on the water level to where when the water comes up, it got to basically right here and then it starts rolling over. So you never see the, the water height on the glass. It's always captured within this top. This is probably about four, four or five inches right here. And uh, we were able to cut that bulkhead in, get it all piped in, and then basically I run the two inch pipe down, I tee it in with the other tanks, it comes out over to here, and then I tee it back in, or well, I couple it back in, and it basically fills up this spillway bowl and then goes out. So we had to play with the flow on a lot of the things for that day. So I, I had to get enough flow to go through 
keep that waterfall running make sure that spillway bowl did not overflow and also i'm keeping a half inch hose on each of them three tanks flowing through now what this means there is no additional pump to run these three mess of tanks the only thing i did add was a linear air pump for water movement i used the the air as uh basically a artsy feature in the tank but also dual purpose to help create flow and aerate the water we don't really need to aerate the water because the water coming in is highly aerated and of course it's splashing in so it's there's kind of a little bit of a method to our madness and then we added on a light onto each tank well there's one on the thousand two on the 700 one here so to basically run these three tanks is absolutely no additional cost and all we had to do was get a little bit uh crafty with how we did our piping but i think this turned out amazing and uh will i do it again absolutely now i'm getting ready to do this same concept with the bellagio tanks and uh you you guys can see how we end up do doing that i was planning on using these sumps somehow but I might just end up getting rid of these things. These are the sumps that came in on the Bellagio tanks. Each sump is four foot long, 30 inches wide, and 36 inches tall. These are massive sumps. There are two of them, as well as we still have the two protein skimmers and the two chillers that came off the Bellagio tank. So if we end up getting rid of them, that'll just be a, a return on the investment of the Bellagio tanks. But I am so happy to see the, these tanks uh, up and going. So usually I give you guys a little rundown of what's happening around here. So I basically just wrapped it up. We've got all the filtration for these tanks up and going. And everything is good to go. The fish are in the tanks. I am still waiting to figure out what I'm going to put in here. But the next projects coming around the, the, the rescue would have to be digging the pond out back and getting those Bellagios plumbed in 100% and uh, on the system. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you guys want to see more crazy adventures with the Ohio Fish Rescue, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And as always, stay fishy, my friend. Alright, so I couldn't leave you guys hanging. For those of you that stuck around for after the end scene, you guys liked when I did it before, so I'm going to go ahead and do this again. Well, for one, you guys can come out here and see the Shack Koi babies. They are getting so big. The biggest one in here is probably about four inches or so, maybe three, three and a half, but they are doing absolutely wonderful. But you can see right here, what is this? Oh, look at that. Our buddy Brian Heron came over and uh, dropped off his, his tractor to go ahead and let us start digging the pond. So you guys know what that means. It's digging time. <laughs>